Welcome to the Alain Guillot podcast, a podcast about life, leadership, and money matters. Our guest today is Scott Ellsworth. Scott is a professor of Afri Afro-American and Af African Studies at the University of Michigan, and he has written about history for the New York Times, the Washington Post, and the Los Angeles Times. He's also the author of The World Beneath Their Feet and Death in a Promised Land. And today, we will speak about his latest work, The Groundbreaking, An American City and Its Search for Justice. Professor Ellsworth, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Alain. It's uh, really great to be on the program. So you are a historian. Uh, you, you are practically living in the past, but I wonder what is it or what was the series of events that took you towards this uh, way of living your life? Well, I think it probably has to do by the fact of the people who raised me. So I'm 67 years old. Uh, my mom and dad and all my aunts and uncles and uh, Uh, they all served during World War II. They also endured the Great, uh, Great Depression. So they were, uh, you know, a group of people that knew that history happened uh, as the 1960s unfolds and all of those changes. They would often refer back to the olden days. So I think that was part of it. Also, when I was in uh, early elementary school years was the centennial of the American Civil War. And there were a lot of stamps and other things. And uh, I had some history books as a child and uh, they caught my eye. I mean, I, there were other things I did too and other interests, but you know, in the end history and particularly writing is where I ended up. Okay, and um, you, uh, you are from Tosla, uh, the place, the white part of Tosla, obviously you're white. Yeah. And, um, I wonder how do you come about this subject of, uh, of interest? Sure. So I was uh, born and raised in Tulsa. And in the era that, you know, that I was raised, the 1921 race massacre was a forbidden subject. It was something that people didn't talk about. It was difficult to find out anything about it. Um, and but even as a kid, you know, before I'm 12 years old, you would occasionally hear people Um, neighbors. My family history just goes back to the 1930s in Tulsa. It doesn't go all the way back, but neighbors discussing what they then called the race riot. And you would walk into the room and they would change the subject or, you know, lower their voices. So it piqued my interest. And then uh, the summer that I turned 12, uh, through a, an incident I write about in this new book, The Groundbreaking, I talk about discovering uh, uh, some microfilmed issues of the Tulsa Tribune, Tulsa World, which, which had these gigantic headlines about this, what we now call the Tulsa Race Massacre. And sort of from that moment on, it became a subject of interest. Okay, so going to the period of 1921, can you describe the whole city of Tulsa and then can we narrow in and tell us what was Greenwood, that neighborhood of focus, Uh, what was it like or what was it that was remarkable, different in particular from other African-American communities in the country? Well, certainly. So um, I think the first thing to remember about Tulsa, it was a, it was a great boom town. Uh, in the year 1900, there were less than a thousand people living in this dusty uh, Creek Indian and cowboy town. In 1920, there were a hundred thousand people living there. 20-story skyscrapers, movie theaters, uh, electric streetcars, mansions, all that. And the reason for that was oil. The, the richest small oil field in the world was discovered across the river from Tulsa uh, after the turn of the century. And that, that created this boom town. And there was a ton of money in Tulsa. And some of that money also went to the African-American community known as Greenwood. Um, blacks made up about 10% of the population of Tulsa. So 10,000 people in 1921, but it was, a, it was a prosperous, vibrant community. There were two theaters, one sat 1,000 people, the other 750. There were two newspapers, a dozen churches, 30 restaurants, 30 grocery stores and meat markets, two schools, a hospital, you know, a public library branch, you know, lots of shops and things like that. 
and uh, it was it was a prosperous place. There was a very small minority in the dozens of families who really did quite well. Had you know modern one and two story wooden homes. They owned automobiles and things like that. But the vast majority of the people of African American adults in Tulsa worked in service jobs in the white community as dishwashers and maids and uh, ditch diggers and childcare workers, things like that, cooks. Uh, but they got pretty good paychecks and there was high employment of women. And so they'd work in the white community all week. But then on you know the end of the week, they'd come home with their pay and they would spend that at black owned businesses. So that allowed for Greenwood to flourish. It almost sounds like too good to be true. And many people refer to Greenwood as the Black Wall Street. I wonder if nowadays uh, there are any similar communities that you say, oh, this is a minority community that is thriving and is good, or it's just this only for their history books. Well, I think it's, you got to look at it, you know, in the time period. I mean, this is the era of segregation, um, you know, uh, and African-Americans generally either could not or would not as much as they could, you know, were able to shop at white owned stores. There was, you know, high um, patronage for African-American institutions. Of course, desegregation changes that also um, redlining and urban renewal. So these old black commercial districts that were in, you know, Durham, North Carolina, and Atlanta, and Harlem, and Chicago, and whatnot, a lot of them faced great challenges. It was also hard for black entrepreneurs after World War II to get the capital to join this new American economy of, of no longer sort of mom and pop restaurants, but franchises, McDonald's, Burger King, you know, whatnot, it was hard to come up with that capital. So the, uh, you know, the nature of, of the economy changed and a lot of African-Americans were left out where some, some of them had been left in early on. Okay, well, then something horrible happened on May 31st, June 1st. Um, and I'm, so, you know, I found out about this two years ago when I was doing an interview like this and I was, horrified and surprised and I couldn't I spent maybe two days digging to what actually happened because I found out through a conversation like this and I was I was in complete disbelief so I'm sure it's still today a lot of people don't know what happened so I, I can you summarize the series of events that brought to this riot slash massacre yeah certainly so um I'll try to be brief because there's a lot of uh, levels to this, but on Monday, May 30th, 1921, a 19-year-old African-American shoe shiner named Dick Rowland walks into an office building to go uh, ride an elevator in downtown Tulsa. In those days, elevators had elevator operators. They weren't automatic, and this was uh, the elevator operator at the Drexel building was a 17-year-old white girl named Sarah Page. And the reason he was going to the elevator was to ride to the top floor where there was a, quote, colored bathroom, a, a bathroom for African-Americans. So he did this all the time. Um, something happens. We think what happened is that as he stepped onto the elevator, he tripped, that he threw out his hands to, to, to block his fall, that he probably grabbed, you know, um, Sarah on the shoulder. She screamed out and he ran out of the elevator. So the police were called, but nobody was super worried at first. The police didn't put out an all points bulletin. They don't go rushing to find him. They do arrest him the next morning. And the wheels of Jim Crow justice are seen to be quietly turning. Um, and in fact, Sarah Page refused to press any charges. But the afternoon white daily newspaper in Tulsa, the Tulsa Tribune got a hold of this and, and printed up this fantastic write up on the front page that said that Dick Rowland had obviously tried to rape Sarah Page, that he you know, scratched her face, tore her clothes, all that. And there's a now famous lost editorial entitled, titled, Two Lynch Negro Tonight. And the Tribune hits the streets at about 3.30 by four o'clock on the afternoon of Tuesday, May 31st. There's lynch talk on the streets of Tulsa. 
uh, and that grows to a white lynch mob gathering outside the courthouse jail where Dick Rowland is held, 100, 200, 500, 1,000 people. Um, meanwhile, word hits Greenwood, the Black community, about you know uh, a young African-American in mortal danger, uh, a group of Black World War I uh, veterans organize themselves. They make a, a, a trip down to the court. They arm themselves. They put on their old uniforms, get in cars, drive down to the courthouse at about 7.30, present themselves to the sheriff, said, we are here to help you defend the prisoner if necessary. The sheriff says, no, get out of here. They leave. But the appearance of these armed Black men just enrages and electrifies the white mob. Members of the mob now, they go home to bring other people. They go to get their own guns. A group tries to break in to the National Guard Armory to get the guns there. And rumors are flying. You know, this is, Elaine, this is, of course, before, you know, radio or television or the Internet. You know, not many people even had telephones. So a lot of rumors. Finally, at about 930 at night, a false rumor hits Greenwood that the whites are storming the jail. This time, 75 black vets go down to the jail, repeat the same process, offer themselves to the sheriff, are turned away as they're leaving. An elderly white man tries to grab a gun, a shot goes off, and the massacre begins. Wow. And do you think the real reason for this is, in, in addition to racial discrimination, is jealousy of the prosperity of the black community at that time? Maybe the white... Uh, people feel threatened by this group of Black people having a prosperous life? I think that is part of the reason. Uh, and there's there's evidence for that. And, there, it, you know, it's no secret that in American society then and today that Black success is, is often receives a lot of criticism in certain white quarters. You know, um, African-American athletes are held to a, a different standard why do they have this money? Why aren't they helping their community? Why are they allowed to speak out? That never happens to white athletes. So, and, you know, any African-American driver of a Lexus or a nice car has been pulled over. Why do you have this? Is this stolen? So I think it's a part of the reason, but it's not the only reason. Um, Durham, North Carolina at the time was a more, had a more prosperous African-American community. Um, they had the largest black owned business in, in the world. They had a black bank, which uh, Greenwood did not, you know, many, many beautiful houses. It was never a tax. So um, it's a part of the reason, but it's not the whole thing. But this has to do with the fact that African Americans in Oklahoma had fled the South, fled lynching, and they were determined to come to this brand new land and to live in a place where lynching is not going to happen. And they were determined to stop it. Right. Okay. So this was the um, the catalyst that uh, started this huge massacre. Let's use the real term. Uh, then the city or the state government tried to bury the memories or try to uh, hide everything. So why were they doing that? Right. And 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 as you've alluded to, I mean, the massacre is gigantic. There are more than 1,000 African-American homes and businesses are looted and burned to the ground. 35 square city blocks are reduced to rubble uh, and you know burned out trees. Um, 10,000 people are, are homeless. Greenwood's wiped off the map. But what happened was the white city fathers who ran the government and the police department and the businesses, they realized that this was a public relations problem for them. And uh, so they tell the world that, oh, white Tulsans are ashamed of this. We're going to rebuild the community. They did not. In fact, they tried to steal the land that part of the community was located on. But they determined we're going to bury this thing. And it and it happened. I mean, for more than 50 years, the riot was the massacre was never written, written about in Tulsa's white daily newspapers. Official records were stolen and disappeared forever. Articles were cut out of newspapers. Uh, and researchers, even as late as the 1970s, were threatened with their lives and their livelihoods if they tried to do this. So it was very effectively buried. 
Okay, uh, so, but is this enough? I mean, we hear today be people being threatened even for writing a tweet, you know, or, or for uh, the anti-maskers versus the, uh, the maskers or the anti-vaxxers. So threatening is very common nowadays, but here it seems like it actually works because both communities, the white community and the black community decide to stay silent. Was the threat that, powerful or or why else do they stay, stay silent for such a long time well no that's a very important point so you know a couple of things happen um you know and we have to remember even though the massacre was front page news in new york times uh the times of london the times of india the news cycle moved on mm -hmm. and oklahoma is far away from the centers of power from media centers you know, in, in New York and Chicago and Los Angeles and all that. So it was a part of the world that would be more forgotten. But the interesting thing, which you allude to, is that the massacre wasn't talked about publicly in the African-American community in Tulsa either. So the, the, the Oklahoma Eagle, which for decades was the flagship black newspaper in Tulsa, they wouldn't write about the massacre. They didn't do it until the late 1960s when black politics changes. But the thing to remember about that is to realize that survivors of the massacre can be compared to Holocaust survivors or to combat veterans. They've gone through this horrible trauma. They didn't want to relive it. But more importantly, they also didn't want to burden their children or grandchildren with these horrible memories. They wanted to look to the future, to look to present things. So I'm 67 years old. I've met descendants grandchildren of, of survivors who told me that even though their grandparents had lost their homes and businesses, that they never spoke about it. And they didn't learn about the massacre until the 1990s. So this was something that was just not discussed. Okay, well, now it's public knowledge. Uh, there are several books written about the subjects. Are there any efforts to, for secure reparation for the victims or, or what's going on right now? Absolutely. There have been efforts, of, um, you know, determined efforts that have gone off and on for, you know, more than 20 years. In the year 2001, the Tulsa Race Riot Commission, a state commission, recommended that uh, financial restitution or reparations be paid to the then 150 known living survivors. The Oklahoma State Legislature refused to do that. Instead, they gave them a gold-plated, he gave them each a gold-plated medal. Um, after that, there was a lawsuit that was uh, filed by Professor Charles Ogletree of the Harvard Law School on behalf of these survivors. Um, this lawsuit made it all the way to the United, Supreme, United States Supreme Court, but the U.S. Supreme Court wouldn't hear it. Um, more recently in the past year, there's been a new lawsuit that's been filed on the behalf of the three known living survivors, but also descendants. Uh, so we'll have to see. I think the legal um, uh, case is gonna be very, I'm not a lawyer, but I think it's got a big hill to climb. Um, I don't think there's any way that the state of Oklahoma, which is a very uh, you know, conservative state, is that the state legislature is gonna pay reparations. I think the only way that reparations will come, and they should come in this case, is either through private donations or the federal government. Right. Um, okay, well, it almost seems like we are living 1921 all over again because now the Oklahoma State, uh, State Board of Education and the governor, I think Kevin Stint, signed a law prohibiting teachers from teaching about this kind of history uh, I, uh, yeah, they are, they are against critical race theory or, or any kind of uh, historical knowledge that make white people this uncomfortable. I wonder what's your opinion about that? Well, it's l ridiculous. Look, I'm a graduate of the Oklahoma public schools. I can tell you that kids in Oklahoma can handle slavery. They can handle Native American removal. They can, they can handle... Pearl Harbor or 9-11. There's a lot of very difficult, the Tulsa race massacre. There's a lot of difficult subjects in American history. Look, American, Americans have much to be proud about in their history. We've given great gifts to the world. 
and but like as with any other group we've got bad parts too and obviously you have to teach those so if we're going to learn from our history we have to be honest with ourselves um, look the students can handle this they can deal with it i think that the teachers are by and large determined to teach anyway so we'll just have to see but these kinds of laws are ridiculous and uh, they're they, they hurt our country frankly yeah, but they, they are ridiculous, but they are spreading through several states. It's just, uh, <laughs> so are we going to have two kinds of education, the education that people learn in the North and the education people have on the South? Well, I, I don't know. We're going to have to see, you know, I was, um, uh, you know, we live right now in what I call the age of reevaluation. And this just isn't in the U.S., it's in Canada, it's in, in Great Britain, there are Lots of statues coming down, lots of, you know, additional plaques put on portraits of famous people who made their money in part through the slave trade. There's a lot going on that we're trying to reassess and reevaluate where we're at. Um, you know, uh, I went my elementary school that I went to was named after Robert E. Lee, the Confederate general. I played on the Lee General's baseball team. Three years ago, the name of that school was changed. Uh, so, you know, I, I, it's, this is not going to play out immediately. This is going to take a while to see what happens. Wow. Well, this is all, uh, I guess we are, as time goes by, we, we are adapting or we discovering who we are and you are giving us or taking us one step closer to finding out about our history. So um, my last question is, can you tell us one more time the title of the book and where can the listeners find out more about it? Certainly. Thank you so much, uh, Alan. And it's just been wonderful to be on your podcast. You are a great interviewer. The name of my book, new book, is called The Groundbreaking, An American City and Its Search for Justice. It came out in May from Dutton, which is part of the Penguin uh, Random House family. It's available you know, everywhere at Amazon, Barnes and Noble, online at your local independent bookstore. Professor Ellsworth, thank you so much for your time. Thank you.